This is Pompeii, an ancient city practically frozen in time. It is so unique that walking on the streets here makes you feel transported back almost 2,000 years ago to when it was one of the most populous cities in the ancient Roman Empire, not only for people from Italy, but also the Greeks and even as far as Egypt. As an Egyptologist and a history lover, I want to see what links there are between Pompeii and Egypt. And trust me, there are quite a few. Many of us are very familiar with the final days of Pompeii and how it became to be so perfectly preserved. In case you didn't know, Pompeii was devastated by a volcanic eruption from Mount Vesuvius in year 79. But what about before that? So much is known about Pompeii's end, but what about their beginnings? In fact, Pompeii suffered from several natural disasters before its ultimate fate. In the year 62 and 63, they experienced small earthquakes and a minor eruption, events that made their faith in the gods even stronger. And led them to become even more devoted to prevent this from happening again. If you ask me, I would have left the second I saw smoke coming out of that mountain. Ironically, while they were still repairing their vast city from the previous damages, the largest eruption finally destroyed them. Only in the mid-1600s, when the volcano erupted again, did modern-day man fully understand what could have caused their demise. Scarily, the most recent eruption was in 1944, So where did Pompeii originate? It's something that we don't really seem to discuss. And it's something that's always interested me. And frankly, I always found the life of Pompeii more interesting than its death. It appears that Pompeii was founded by a group of people from Italy's region of Campania, known as the Oscans. They settled here as a result of the close proximity to the river, ocean, and a sloping mountain, as well as very fertile soil. This was around the 7th century BC. However, there is suggesting evidence that the first settlements here were around the 9th century BC which could make Pompeii almost 3,000 years old. Hi, Cleopatra. 
Hi, how are you? I'm great, and you? I'm very well, thanks. I'm doing well. <laughs> well, you know, I, I remember a while back when we spoke, you mentioned that you found something that helps prove who founded Pompeii. Can you tell me a little more about that? Yeah, so about five years ago when I was uh, digging at Pompeii, um, I found this piece of pottery with this very rare alphabet on it called New Syrian. And I showed it to my professor and he was very excited. And he said this was one of the most exciting finds from the last decade. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was an amazing moment. Um, and basically it, it shines a light on who actually founded Pompeii, whether it was the Greeks themselves, whether it was Etruscan foundations or whether it was locals inspired by the Greeks. Yeah. And this, the appearance of this alphabet so early on in Pompeii's history uh, builds the case for the fact that it was actually the locals who um, founded Pompeii. So it was, a bit, it, was, it was a big find and it was amazing to have had a role in that. That is quite a revelation. I mean, everyone thinks it's either Etruscans or Greeks or Oscans. So here we have a civilization from the local area. That's quite amazing. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was an incredible, incredible moment. These early settlements in and around the vicinity of Pompeii were rather small and independent. In the 8th century BC, the Greeks arrived looking for a place to stop over on their oil, wine and goods trading route. They settled in the area, creating their new city. The Greeks then moved to southern Italy, where they founded their Grisha Magna and created this city. Naples, or Neapolis, as it was named by the Greeks, would become the key point for the Greeks to colonize southern Italy, which would later become known as Grisha Magna. Their culture spread through the south as far as Sicily, where they built several cities and temples. Many Greeks from the new city, Neapolis, would now move to Pompeii, which was right across the bay. And that is how the Greek influence started. However, the Etruscans came into Pompeii and their influence was mixed with the Greeks in 700 BC. Then the Samnites arrived in the 5th century. Though an empire just north wanted Pompeii. In 310 BC, Pompeii became an ally of Rome, but was not fully under Roman control. Rome had a huge influence on Pompeii, not only in religion, but architectural style and cultural influences. Finally, in 89 BC, Roman rule was fully in power at Pompeii, and Latin then replaced all languages in Pompeii as its one true official language. A very sophisticated class of people lived here. Their art, architecture, city planning, and ideals were quite beautiful. 
Yes, they loved having a good party, amongst other things. But Pompeii was the city to live in 2,000 years ago. At its height, Pompeii was home to almost 20,000 people. Because of its multicultural inhabitants in and around Pompeii, the city was home to Roman-style villas, Greek-style amphitheaters, and temples with a touch of ancient Egypt. We know that the Greeks had a big influence on Pompeii. With temples dedicated to Dionysus, the Greek god of wine and fertility, Apollo, and Heracles, also known as Hercules. Rome was influenced by Egypt in the second century BC during the reign of Pharaoh Ptolemy VI. And of course, during the famous love affair of Cleopatra and Julius Caesar. At Dindira Temple in Egypt, we can see them together. Cleopatra and Caesar and their son Caesarian. Rome was heavily influenced by ancient Egypt around 45 BC. But what of Pompeii? They were already aware of Egypt hundreds of years before Egypt's influence on Rome. My friend Alex, an archaeologist and tour guide who is born in modern Pompeii, wants to show me a villa that he believes will give me the link to prove the connection between Egypt and Pompeii. Alex, there aren't many very in-your-face signs that Pompeii was influenced by ancient Egypt, right? Right, Curtis. We don't have many, but there are a few very pretty ones. Mm -hmm. and. Let me show you one. Okay, show me. This way. <laughs> Andiamo. <laughs> Curtis, when we were talking before about um, Egyptian influences here in Pompeii, this is the house I was thinking of. Okay. House of the Gilded Cupids. And it's this which I wanted you to see. right here in the house of the Gilded Cupids. Behind of us, we have this amazing shrine, which does clearly recall a lot of Egyptian symbolism. The Apophis snakes, temple implements, and of course, the gods. We have Anubis, Horus, the little Horus, Isis, and Osiris. But notice, these Egyptian gods are wearing Greek robes, and Osiris has a full beard. But at the same time, notice this great attempt of religious syncretism as the cultures are blending in. Anubis, on his left shoulder, he is holding the caduceus, the staff of god Hermes, god Mercury. In the same house, on the other side, we would have found the traditional Roman shrine with the statues of Zeus, Jupiter for the Romans, Juno, Minerva, the two Lattice, the household gods, and Mercury too. Osiris was the god of agriculture and the afterlife. His wife was Isis, and their son was Horus, the reincarnation of the pharaoh. Anubis was the leader of the dead. An Egyptian cobra, along with the temple implements, such as the instrumental sistrum used to evoke the gods. We know of several Greek gods and goddesses who were worshipped at Pompeii. However, 
many Egyptian deities were revered in the city as well. A great temple to Isis is at Pompeii. The worship of the Egyptian goddess Isis spread throughout the Mediterranean thousands of years ago. Many festivals were held here at Pompeii to Isis, and her followers ranged from slaves to the highest of nobility. We even know that Nile water was specifically brought to Pompeii to be used as holy water during these ceremonies. I, Isis, am the only ruler of time, sole inspector of the limits of the sea and the land. With scepter in hand, the one mistress. In fact, all name me supreme goddess, the greatest of all gods in heaven. For I myself have discovered everything and to calm this toil. The writing will prove it, revealing to all my intentions, which I disclose to you at the fruits of life. I fortify the cities with reverend walls, and to you I have allowed knowledge and skills. Without me, nothing has ever come to existence. Neither do the stars move on the same journey without having first received from me their instructions. Nor will the earth bear fruit in spring, if I did not approve all. I grant you love and life and good fortune. I've come into Naples to look for more clues. Dispersed throughout the archaeological museum are links between Egypt and Pompeii, if you know where to look. Little-known artifacts, and some on a grander scale, proving Egyptians were at Pompeii. Inside the Temple of Isis at Pompeii, we have depictions of many Egyptian gods, such as this one, the god Bes, the god of protecting children and sex. Bes is one of only a few Egyptian gods that were adopted into the Greek and Roman world. The strange looking creature is a mix between a dwarf and a lion. Even a scene showing the Egyptian god of the dead, the leader of the dead, Anubis. However, he's shown wearing a very Roman cloak, if you would say, and Greek-style sandals. Yet his face is of the Egyptian jackal god, and this was shown in several houses in Pompeii and even found in a private home at Pompeii is a bronze votive statue to Anubis. Many Nihilesque animals are shown at the Temple of Isis as a way to connect the inhabitants of Pompeii to Egypt still. We have an Egyptian lion and of course a sacred ibis, very Egyptianized for this part of the Mediterranean. And even the worship of the Egyptian Apis bull. Because the Temple of Isis was badly affected by the volcanic eruption, many of the scenes have been taken from the temple in Pompeii across the bay into the Naples Archaeological Museum. The Egyptian cobra, Uraeus, also symbolizing the goddess Wajet, is shown throughout the area. During the later New Kingdom in Egypt, Isis was believed to be connected to the cobra as she became the goddess of magic, a reason why Cleopatra 
was so entertained with the thought of speaking to snakes. Just like in Egypt, the Isis temple at Pompeii had a hierarchy of priests and priestesses. Daily rituals occurred at the temple with offerings being brought to the statue of the goddess. A priest with a citula full of milk would be present. While the high priest read from the papyrus invoking the goddess. The highest order of priests would be clean-shaven, and they would walk around during the ceremonies, spreading incense, as they believed the goddess would manifest within the perfumed smoke. The images show priests holding sistrums, an instrument shaken to evoke the presence of a god, usually shown with the cow goddess Hathor. But the actual sistrums excavated from Pompeii show the face of Isis. The priests are also dressed in very Egyptian costume. These rare ceremonial scenes give us a vivid idea of what religion was like not only in Pompeii, but also within Egypt. Of course, the most important scene in the temple is the goddess Isis herself, with baby Horus holding his hand up to his chin, a little like Ramses II statues. Isis slowly entertains an Egyptian cobra, while the priests surround her with the evocative temple artifacts. And for good measure at her feet, an Egyptian Nile crocodile These wall paintings only serve a certain purpose. At the center of the temple is the goddess Isis herself. Only the inner clergy of the temple were allowed access to her. The beautiful statue of Isis with her hand out, the one leg forward, just like the Egyptian art. And her hand, you just want to touch it. We aren't aware of any conflict between the Egyptians and the so called native people of Pompeii they all appeared to get along quite well. Pompeii was such a mix of cultures, I don't think anyone could judge the other. Cleopatra, why do you think that Pompeii was so accepting of different cultures and different religions? Well, this, this area and this time period has a history of I mean, it's on the Mediterranean, so these cultures are coming in and out. So it has a long history of so many cultures, so many different people, everything kind of meshing together. So it's it's no surprise that um, that you see this kind of amalgamation of all these cultures and this acceptance. Pompeii, just like Roman world, uh, I do strongly believe Romans were pretty tolerant regarding religions. Um, Christianity, we know that became more than a political issue. 
But Pompeii, starting from its origins, the foundations, founded by the Oscans, local population strongly influenced by the Etruscans. Pompeii was strongly influenced by the Greeks. Um, Pompeii was surrounded by Greek colonies. And when you trade in goods, you trade in culture at the same time. The presence of the Temple of Isis from the second century before Christ, perhaps created by uh, the sailors of Alexandria of Egypt, do show what uh, great melting pot this city would have been. Finally, too, with the arrival of the Romans, which are blending in, it does create this multicultural society. When did the Egyptian influence arrive in Pompeii, though? They could have arrived back in the 7th century BC with the Greeks. As we know, the Egyptians and the Greeks had very close ties with almost little to no conflict at all. In fact, artifacts dating back from 525 BC from the reign of Pharaoh Zamtik III have been found in Pompeii and neighboring Ercolano. Back in Naples, tucked away in the museum's Egyptian section, the pharaohs leave us even more clues. Artifacts dating from the reign of Pharaoh Zamtik III, such as a fragmented obelisk and this beautiful basalt table marking the coronation of the pharaoh. You can see his cartouche here, Zamtik. And over here, we have a great hieroglyph showing the king striding. This table of Zamtik, which was found at a private villa in Pompeii, was it actually given to the owner of the villa or was it taken there after the Pharaoh's death? You see, at the end of Zamtik's rule, the Persians had taken over Egypt which could have caused many families to want to leave Egypt and go to their allies in Greece, or even Grisha Magma. That could explain how artifacts from Zamtik III ended up in Pompeii. Even a seated Egyptian statue of the pharaoh, Zamtik, with Greek on it. We have the evidence from a short period later on, though, that there were, in fact, immigrants from Egypt arriving in Pompeii. And why not? They had a similar culture and religion. Simatawi, a high official in Egypt during the Persian occupation in 300 BC, could provide a clue. In 332 BC, Semitawi saw the liberation of Egypt from the Persians by one of Macedonia Greeks, greatest conquerors, Alexander the Great. Our Egyptian official wrote down his accounts of the expulsion of the Persians by Alexander. This is the stela of Semetawi. After Alexander the Great left his short stay in Egypt, however, he remained pharaoh. Semetawi wrote down his accounts of Alexander defeating the Persians. And shortly after Alexander left Egypt, Semetawi became the high priest of the son of Isis, Horus.
his stela was originally placed in Egypt, but it could have been brought here possibly by a family member when they immigrated to Pompeii, as his stela was found here at the Temple of Isis. I say this because we have several homes at Pompeii with a considerable Egyptian influence, with Egyptian gods on the walls, or even Egyptian wildlife such as cobras, ibis birds, and crocodiles. It is entirely possible that someone who came from Egypt had these scenes put on the walls to feel more at home. There have even been sphinxes and shabtis found in private homes in Pompeii, like this little one here. A sphinx is an Egyptian symbol, and it's staggering how many were found at Pompeii. Not only guardians, they also symbolize the sun resting on the horizon. The Egyptian god Bess, with a female sphinx, all of these found at homes in Pompeii. At the Temple of Isis in Pompeii, we have a statue of the Egyptian Nile god Hapi. And here, Hapi is not depicted in the usual Greek. Roman style that we see the Egyptian art adapted to in Pompeii. Here, Hapi is shown as fully Egyptian. Hundreds of these uniquely Egyptian Shabti figurines were found in private homes and buried around the Temple of Isis. Isis, giver of life, residing in the sacred mound, the lady of Begad Philae, she, the one who pours out the inundation, that makes all people live, and green plants grow, to provide divine offerings for the gods, and invocation offerings for Osiris. For She's the lady of heaven. Her man is the lord of the next world, the pure water, rejuvenating himself at Philae in his time. Her son is lord of the land. Indeed, she's the lady of heaven and a new world. She who brought them into existence through what her heart can see and her hands created. She's the soul that is in every city, watching over her son, Horus, and her love, Osiris. The House of Fawn in Pompeii could provide us with the link we need to prove that the ancient Egyptians had immigrated to Pompeii. In the villa's garden, several sphinxes were found. A sphinx, as we know, is an Egyptian symbol. Archaeologists are not entirely certain of the origins of the owners of the House of Fawn, but certain evidence 
does lead us to one conclusion. House of Fawn has some of the most beautiful mosaics, including some very Egyptian style scenes, like this one showing the Nile. Here we see some of the plants from the Nile, such as the palm tree. We see Egyptian geese, a cobra, papyrus, a hippo, a crocodile, lotus flowers, and bird life from the Nile, such as the sacred ibis. This scene shows life happening on the Nile. This sort of scene does not happen in Italy, nor in Pompeii. This scene is very blatantly Egyptian. Were the inhabitants from this house in Pompeii actually from Egypt? More than likely, yes. And this, a five and a half meter mosaic created out of one and a half million cut tiles. It is Alexander the Great chasing the Persians out of Egypt, dating from around 120 BC, over 100 years since the battle actually took place. But why was this shown in a private villa in Pompeii? We know that Alexander never visited Pompeii. So why was this scene shown here, along with other Egyptian-style scenes? Since the Greek influence was so strong in Pompeii, as well as the Egyptian influence, the image of a Greek freeing Egypt from the Persians was seen as the ultimate symbol of power. And that is why we have this beautiful scene of Alexander the Great in Pompeii, represented in Egypt. If you could only feel the fires of love, driver, you would hurry more to enjoy the pleasures of Venus. I love young Charmer. Please, spur on the horses. Let's go on. You've had your drink. Let's go. Take the reins and crack the whip. Take me to Pompeii, where my sweet love lives. The people here worshipped Isis and Osiris as they believed they could grant them eternal life. And in a way, they did. For if we speak about them, they are still with us to today. Thank you.